Hello, um, my name is Lauren Carson, Head of Research Development at UK Biobank. Thanks for watching all of the sessions so far. We're about to go for a short tea break, during which we will show you the fantastic entries of our three minute doctoral thesis competition. After the break, we will be announcing the winner of the three minute competition and also revealing the runner up and winner of the Early Career Researcher of the Year Award. See you after the break. supervisor is Professor Boritek and the subject of the thesis is deep learning based analysis of retinal OCT optical coherence tomography scans for detection of Alzheimer's disease. Dementia is called a general term for symptoms like decline in memory, reasoning or other skills. However, Alzheimer is a specific brain disease that accounts for 60 to 80 percent of dementia cases. According to Alzheimer's organization in US, one in three seniors dies with AD or other forms of dementia, and it is expected to double in the following 20 years. AD is first suspected during the medical examinations, and that's followed by cognitive tests. Most of the time, it is confirmed by neuroimaging techniques and or biomarker tests. There are new researches on different techniques called OCT, which detects structural and vascular changes in the retina. Eye is an extension to the brain, which consists of layers of neural cells. These cells grow from the same origin as the brain cells. Therefore, eye is considered as a window to the brain. There are different modalities, and these are called fundus, OCT, and OCT angiography. In my thesis, we will focus on deep learning, which is a very powerful and automated area under artificial intelligence domain. Deep learning stimulates human brain, neurons, and neural connections to solve complicated real life problems. Focus on deep learning in optical imaging modalities is increasing every year. Deep learning methods, unfortunately, are data hungry. They require high number of label AD images. However, collecting medical data requires extensive work and time. Therefore, UK Biobank data is priceless in our research. We are looking for answers of two research questions. Can we devise an, an artificial neural network based algorithm, i.e. deep learning algorithm, to differentiate between an OCT or OCTA scan of an Alzheimer's patient or mild cognitive impairment than an OCT scan of a normal person. And in the second question, given that we devise a method to answer the first question, in the second question, it is whether the region's appearances associated with Alzheimer's disease by the algorithm are relevant from an ophthalmologist perspective. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Xia Jie Zhao, third year P student in MRC Epidemiology Unit. Today, I want to talk about our latest result on Masaglos Y chromosome, which is the most common form of clonal system. As we all know, most men have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, but with aging growing, part of some men's white blood cells will lose their Y chromosome. This phenomenon is called Masaglos Y chromosome, except for aging. Smoking and genetics are also thought to contribute to loss of Y. There is a lot of epidemiological evidence demonstrating that loss of Y is associated with various diseases and traits, including cancers, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and all-cause mortality. In UK Bio Bank, about 20% of male participants have loss of Y. However, the causes and the consequences of loss of Y are still limited. Different from previous analysis of loss of Y, we have developed a novel formula to combine different independent loss of Y measures, estimated from sniper ray data, to improve statistical power and perform the first exome wide gene burden testing using a whole exome sequence data from UK Biobank. Based on over 80,000 males, we have identified a novel association between GigaF1 and loss of Y. The loss of function variants of GRF1 can sixfold increase risk to have loss of Y. 
Chica Wi-Fi is named after its knowing binding to GRB10 and interacts with both insulin and IG1 receptors. We therefore hypothesize that loss function ileo may also impact the metabolic health. We then conducted the Chica Wi-Fi and burden test across the metabolic health-related traits in both men and women. Strikingly, a long-time neglected gene, only mentioned by eight papers in PubMed, has significant adverse effect on metabolic health. The loss function carriers have six-fold increased risk with type 2 diabetes, higher BMI, body fat mass and waist ratio, but lower graph strength and IG1 levels. In our future study, we are planning to build GigaWi-Fi mouse model to replicate the phenotypes. Extend our analysis on female loss of X and further explore the relationship between the cancers and loss of Y. Finally, I want to thank my supervisors, my colleagues, and our external collaborators from Broad Institute and Peking University. Many thanks for your listening. If you have any further questions, feel free to ask me through an email. Hello, everyone. I'm Ahmed. I'm PhD students at Verona University and learn white program. Today I will talk about the telomere length association with the brain IDPC to UK biobank data. So telomere length is shortening over time with every cell cycle during each cell cycle. And this shortening has been associated with many uh, traits and aging related diseases such as Alzheimer and coronary heart diseases as well as facial skin aging. We therefore wanted to investigate the association between telomere length shortening and brain IDPs, which consequently will affect the cognitive function. So therefore, we selected 23 sleeves. These sleeves were significantly associated with telomere length and were publicly available. They were selected from a previous study. For the brain IDPs, we uh, selected three uh, around 4,000 uh, brain IDBs that their GWAS summary uh, statistics publicly available and they used UK biobank data to perform the GWAS for all of these uh, brain IDBs. They were covered um, different MRI modalities such as diffusion, structural and functional MRI. So uh, we used these IDBs as the outcome to perform the association. For that matter, we used Mandela randomization two samples, uh, inverse version weighted method were used as the primary analysis alongside with other complementary analysis. We also uh, had to be sure that there is no significant association between these 23 SNPs and the brain IDBs just to follow the assumptions of Mandela randomization studies. Among the around 4,000 tests, we found 193 brain IDBs were causally influenced by shortening telomere length. This was confirmed in the main and the complementary analysis. And the figure in the left shows all the IDPs and also shows the FDR uh, p-value correction line. Also, the color shows from which uh, modality are these IDPs, the ones that with the black uh, border are those significantly influenced by telomere length in the main and also in the complementary analysis. The figure on the right uh, shows um, the regions of these IDPs. They were mostly from diffusion MRI as it shows in the picture. So like for fractional anisotropy, L1, uh, 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 radial uh, 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 diffusivity, axial diffusivities, and also uh, mean diffusivity. Also there were some white to gray um, intensity contrast uh, among the uh, significant uh, IDBs that were influenced by shortening telomere length. And thank you so much. Hello, I'm Keisha and I'm a PhD student at the University of Leicester and I've used UK Biobank data to help identify novel genetic signals associated with ACE inhibitor induced cough. ACE inhibitors are primarily used for the treatment of hypertension, which affects one in four adults worldwide. They are largely well tolerated, but between 5 and 35% of users experience a dry cough, which often results in a switch to an angiotensin II receptor blocker, or ARB, which is in accordance with current clinical guidelines. 
This adverse reaction is poorly understood and pharmacogenomic studies can provide insight into involved mechanisms and pathways. However, these studies are known to be limited by small sample size as data on drug response and adverse drug reaction phenotypes are not widely collected at baseline. Therefore, I have harnessed electronic health records linked to UK Biobank and the EXCEED study to define a phenotype for ACE inhibitor induced cough. My phenotyping algorithm identified cases who switched from ACE inhibitors to ARBs and controls who were continuous users of ACE inhibitors. And combined with imputed genomic data linked to both cohorts, I performed a stage one meta-analysis with thanks to UK Biobank had a sample size approximately seven times that of the largest previous genome-wide study of this phenotype. A joint meta-analysis with stage two study, the Emerge Network, identified five independent sentinel variants. Of these, one has been previously described and four are novel. Fine mapping of these loci were performed to identify putative causal variants for variant to gene mapping, which included five well-known elements. Among the map genes, as expected, KCNIT4 was identified, as well as two genes, NTSR1 and PREP, which are both involved in the mediation of neuropeptide activity, which supports hypotheses which suggest this adverse reaction is a response to the accumulation of inflammatory neuropeptides upon ACE inhibition. Strong genetic correlation with chronic dry cough and further analysis of the NTSR locus in a FIWA study identify genetic overlap with chronic cough phenotypes defined in UK Biobank. In summary, this study has identified genetic signals and putative causal genes for which functional follow-up has given insights to the currently unclear mechanism of ACE inhibitor-induced cough susceptibility. Identifying genes and pathways underlying drug responses provides a crucial first step towards identifying why adverse reactions occur and how to predict and prevent them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kevin Kwong, a recent PhD graduate from the Ross Lab at the University of Toronto. Today I'm going to present my work on assessing computational variant effect predictors with the UK Biobank cohort. I'd like to begin with this crisis, which is a lack of a better interpretation for most human missense variants. In fact, only 2% of the 4.6 million missense variants in NOMAD have been clinically interpreted. And for those variants in ClinVar with clinical interpretation, over 50% are interpreted as variants of uncertain significance, or VUSs. These VUSs contributed minimally to clinical decision making. Computational predictors can help interpret the likelihood of pathogenicity of human genetic variants, especially for the majority of variants where no experimental data are available. As shown here, widely used variant interpretation guidelines accept computational prediction as a source of functional evidence. It remains challenging to assess the performance of computational predictors. One particular challenge is establishing independent test datasets. The UK Biobank cohort is an independent test set with three main advantages. First, size. As a large prospective cohort, UK Biobank contains 500,000 genotype and phenotype participants. Second, data availability. Through the recently released research analysis platform, researchers can easily access whole exome sequences of 450,000 participants and information on 7,000 traits. Third, independence. Very few variant effect predictors have been trained on this data, minimizing the risk of performance inflation due to data circularity. With the help of my colleagues, namely Roger Lee and Joe Wu, I assessed 20 variant effect predictors using the UK Biobank cohort as an independent test set. If you are interested in the methods I used, please refer to the preprint by scanning the QR code here. The benchmark results suggest that Verity and Revel are the best performing variant effect predictors at predicting trades in the UK Biobank cohort. It's worth noting that Verity and Revel were statistically indistinguishable, thus both considered as the best performing predictors here. Applying the best performing predictors, I performed a small-scale burden test on 40 cardiovascular disease-related traits and 450 exomes. I identified 42 gene trait combinations associated with rare variant burden. In particular, 
Verity showed stronger sensitivity than Revel as it identified 68% more gene trait combinations. In addition, this burden test identified 133% more gene trait combinations than the genome-wide burden test using the 450k exomes. As the next step, to minimize potential underlying biases in the UK Biobank, I'm going to repeat the burden test in another independent cohort. I'm also expanding the burden test to include more traits in the UK Biobank. With that, I'd like to thank Roslab members and our collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you for listening. Hi there, my name is Logan Williams, and today I'm going to talk about a new set of brain imaging measures that we are developing for the UK Biobank. Having a map of the cerebral cortex, or the outermost layer of the brain, is an essential neuroscientific tool. Currently, the standard cortical map used in the UK Biobank is based on brain folding. The advantages of this map are that it is straightforward to generate and is very commonly used within the scientific community. However, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between brain folding and brain function, which limits the utility of this map when investigating complex biological relationships. In 2016, the Human Connectome Project generated a more biologically meaningful map of the cortex, using features that better represent brain function and organisation. These features include the T1 over T2 ratio, which is a measure of intracortical myelination, and resting state fMRI maps, which highlight cortical regions that share the same activity over time. The true potential of this brain mapping approach lies in the ability to generate cortical maps specific to each person. Capturing subtle variability in brain organisation across tens of thousands of UK biobank subjects then allows us to tackle very complicated questions with more confidence. Although work is still ongoing, I want to briefly share the results to date. The first step was to create these functional surface features using the cortical surfaces and outputs from the UK Biobank Imaging Pipeline. Next, we optimised the alignment of functional features across subjects. This step is critical to defining cortical regions in the multimodal atlas and ensures point-to-point -point correspondence across all subjects. This functional alignment approach is then compared to alignment by cortical folding, which is most commonly used. Despite differences in imaging protocols, the group average UK Biobank myelin map, driven by functional alignment, closely resembles the group average human connector myelin map. Particularly important are the sharp boundaries of the middle temporal complex and the appearance of the lateral interparietal area. This is compared to the group average UK Biobank myelin map driven by folding, where the middle temporal complex is poorly defined and the lateral interparietal area is absent. The final step is generating subject-specific cortical maps. Here, a robust automated approach is essential because it is not possible to manually define cortical maps for all subjects. Using the same machine learning classifier as the Human Connectome Project achieves promising results. We are currently in the process of training a similar classifier on the UK Biobank data, and further validation experiments are planned for the future. Finally, I would like to thank everyone involved in this project, the participants, staff and funders of the UK Biobank, and the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. Hi, I'm Katie, I'm a PhD student at Cardiff University, and I've been using the UK Biobank to identify phenotypes linked with ST6 cell one and Hanfoot syndrome. This work I'm about to show has recently been published in the International Journal of Cancer. My work focuses on identifying genetic variants associated with the development of toxicities to chemotherapeutics. Using data from the coin and coin gene clinical trials, I've performed GWASs for 10 toxicities and identified a significant locus associated with the development of foot syndrome, a dose-limiting toxicity where small amounts of chemotherapeutic agent leaks out of the capillaries into the hands and feet, which damages the surrounding tissues. We mapped this significant locus to a gene called sd 6 gal one Previous GWASs have revealed the SNPs in sd 6 gal one are linked to MS, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, and asthma. Interestingly, diabetics are at increased risk of developing hand foot syndrome, and so we wanted to look in the UK Biobank for an association, both for our lead SNP and others across the gene, to see if sd 6 gal one was the link between the two phenotypes. Since symptoms of hand foot syndrome include arrhythmia and skin blisters, I also wanted to look at markers of inflammation and wound healing. Looking specifically at the lead SNP for hand foot syndrome, we analysed seven markers of inflammation or wound healing and one for diabetes. The T allele of our lead SNP was associated with lowered lymphocyte count, which supports a previous observation where circulating sd 6 gal one was shown to modulate B-cell production. The T allele was also associated with lowered glycated hemoglobin, a marker routinely used in the diagnosis of diabetes. So here we identified another two phenotypes our SNP had a significant association with. 
I also tested 614 SNPs spanning ST6 cell 1 for an association with type 2 diabetes in UK Biobank using around 17,000 cases and 317,000 controls. This is a layered locus zoom plot showing SNPs in ST6 cell 1 and their associations with hand foot syndrome in blue and type 2 diabetes in red. The y axis shows a negative log of the p value and the x axis chromosomal position. You can see that another SNP of ST6 cell 1 is significantly associated with type 2 diabetes and it is a known type 2 diabetes variant. The lead SNPs for Hanfeld syndrome and type 2 diabetes were not in linkage to equilibrium, so the two loci are independent. My data supports as an interrelationship between SD6 cell 1 Hanfeld syndrome and type 2 diabetes. SD6 cell 1 has had an established role in inflammation, and the inflammatory pathway seems to be the underlying mechanism here in how this gene affects many phenotypes and how in turn these phenotypes affect each other. Importantly, in clinical trials, we noted that the patients with hand foot syndrome had better response to chemotherapy at 12 weeks, so understanding the underlying mechanism may help improve treatment efficacy. This is where the UK Biobank really benefited us, as we could use it to find these linked phenotypes that otherwise we had no data on. I would like to say a big thank you to all the co-authors of my paper, my supervisors and Cardiff University for funding my PhD. Hello, welcome back. Um, for those of you who missed it before um, the break, my name is Lauren Carson, Head of Research Development at UK Biobank, and I now have the pleasure of uh, introducing the, uh, uh, sorry, announcing the Early Career uh, Researcher Award runners up and winners, as well as the uh, winner of the three minute thesis competition. So, congratulations to our three minute thesis competition winner, who is Keisha Coley from the University of Leicester with their talk, Novel Genetic Signals Identified for Angiotensin Converting Enzyme ACE Inhibitor Induced Cough. Congratulations to them, and they have won a £300 Amazon voucher as part of this award. Next, we are moving on to the runners-up of our Early Career Researcher Award. So uh, these jointly go to Anya Topawala from the University of Oxford, um, with the title of Impact of Moderate Alcohol Consumption on Brain, Iron cog and Cognition, Obser Observational and Genetic Analyses. And also jointly congratulations to Frank Wendt from Yale School of Medicine with their talk, Phenome-Wide Association Study of Loci Harboring De Novo Tandem Repeat Mutations in UK Biobank Exomes. And both of those um, awardees have won £500. And now it is my great pleasure to congratulate the winner of our Early Career um, Researcher Award competition winner, who is Mahan Nakui um, from MassGen and the Broad Institute, and their talk of uh, spatially distinct genetic determinants of aortic dimensions influence risk of aneurysm and stenosis. Congratulations to them and their award of over £1,000. Over to Mahan to present his talk. Thank you, Dr. Carson, and thank you to Professor Allen and the remainder of the UK Biobank scientific team for this incredible honor and for the opportunity to speak to you today. The title of my talk is Spatially Distinct Genetic Determinants of Aortic Disease Risk. I have no relevant personal financial relationships to disclose, so let's get started. Today, I'd invite you to consider thoracic aortic aneurysm. The aorta, of course, is the largest vessel of the body carrying blood directly from the heart, first towards the head and then arching toward the feet to exit the chest and continue in the abdomen. The enlargement of the thoracic aorta begins without symptoms, but it is incredibly morbid. It contributes to 17,000 deaths annually in the US alone. And while there are American screening protocols to detect aneurysm in the abdomen, there are no such guidelines to find asymptomatic aneurysm in the chest. If the ascending aorta remains dilated, it's at risk for tearing or dissecting. At this point, patients unfortunately can face a 50% mortality before they even arrive at a hospital. So given that this disease often goes undetected until it's too late, it behooves us to ask how we might identify people who are at risk and who might benefit from early screening. The scientific community has naturally turned to genetics and several familial syndromes have been described as a result. Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, et cetera. But clinical experience suggests that these syndromes only capture a small fraction of the pathology. And so our group and others have asked, 
What are the common genetic variants that contribute to aortic diameter? In our prior work led by James Piricello, we applied deep learning to UK Biobank cardiac MRI images to identify and measure the aorta in the chest. We used these diameters as quantitative traits for genome-wide association studies and found several significant associations. Further, we found that a polygenic score built from these loci predicted uh, incidence of aortic aneurysm. And so common genetic variants do seem to be playing a role. But that work had an important limitation. It was limited to a single slice in the chest. Now, we know this anatomic region to be spatially complex. It has multiple unique embryologic origins, and it's the source for distinct pathologies, some of which are listed here. And so for our current work, we set out to ask, can we find the genetic basis for the size of this complex tract that spans from the left ventricle to the ascending aorta? And if so, what can these genetic signatures tell us about disease? This is the left ventricular outflow tract view from the UK Biobank's cardiac MRI dataset. As you can see, it displays our structures of interest along the axis of the aorta, and so it's well suited for serial diameters along the tract. Now, we know from previous work that we'll need tens of thousands of participants to adequately power the study, which is impractical as a manual task, and so again, we turn to automation. Our first step in measuring diameters is to identify our structures. I manually annotated 250 images and used this to train a deep learning model to label each pixel in a given image to its associated structure. As you can see, I used the model to label the LVOT, the aortic root, which is the aortic sinus in this study, and the ascending aorta. We applied this model to about 2.3 million images for about 43,000 participants. Now, knowing which pixels in the images represent which structure, our next task was to measure serial diameters. Paolo Diaschile led this effort. He used classical image processing algorithms to detect the midline of the vessel, draw lines that are orthogonal to the midline, and therefore measure the diameters. We chose to define eight total diameters, one at the LVOT, one at the sinus of Valsalva, which again, we call aortic root in our study. And then just beyond this, six serial diameters of the ascending aorta. After quality control, we are left with about 34,000 participants with both a phenotype and genetic data available. So we took the eight diameters I mentioned and used each as a quantitative phenotype for a genome-wide association study. Taken together, we found 79 loci that were associated with one or more diameter. 35 of these were novel. Oftentimes, these loci overlapped, and we wondered if they did so in a spatially relevant fashion. We noticed that there seemed to be distinct genetic signatures as one looks from more proximal diameters to more distal ones. This Venn diagram displays this relationship at a high level, and our upcoming paper digs a bit deeper using hierarchical clustering. So there appear to be these distinct genetic signatures along the tract, but what can these genetics tell us about clinical disease? For each diameter's GWAS, we used the HITS to create a polygenic score for the remainder of the available UK Biobank participants, excluding those who participated in cardiac imaging. Then we looked to see if these scores together with clinical covariates could predict incidence of thoracic aneurysm using Cox models. The results are here. Each line represents the performance of a given score. The red bars are effect size, and gray bars are significance level, where bigger bars are more significant. The dashed line vertically is P of 0 0.05. Now, you'll notice that all eight scores did predict aneurysm, but what we found really fascinating was the performances of these scores relative to each other. The strongest signal comes from this diameter we call aorta one, which is about one centimeter from the sinotubular junction. And one begins to lose signal as one steps away anatomically in either direction. 
Here is a visual of the effect sizes overlaid on the anatomy. Based on these data, we concluded that this area just distal to the junction might be the region of ascending aorta whose genetics could be most relevant to ascending aortic aneurysm. We were also curious to apply the technique to predicting aortic valvular stenosis, narrowing of the aortic valve. We again built polygenic scores, but this time scores of smaller diameters rather than larger ones. The strongest signal this time comes from the aortic root diameter. And again, we lose signal in anatomic order in either direction. In this case, the distal diameters are no longer associated with disease incidence. Again, here we see the effect size overlaid on anatomy. And from this, we see the conclusion that the genetics of a smaller aortic root seems to be relevant to the risk of aortic stenosis. So again, we drew three main conclusions from our study. First, that the proximal ascending aorta may contain spatially distinct genetic signatures associated with tract size. Second, that there may be a region of ascending aorta just distal to the sinotubular junction whose genetics are associated with the risk of thoracic aneurysm. And third, that a genetically estimated smaller aortic root is relevant to the risk of aortic stenosis. With future work, these genetic signatures could help us better identify individuals at risk of aortic disease who may benefit from screening, and it could help us facilitate therapies for subtypes of aortic pathology, such as root predominance or root sparing aneurysms. Many thanks, of course, to the co-first author of this study, James Piricello, mentors Mark Lindsay and Patrick Eleanor, and additional co-authors listed here. Thank you also to the UK Biobank, of course, for making this work possible. And finally, to additional mentors, Javius, Kerry Sokol, and Jay Rajagopal. And here are the disclosures and funding sources for my co-authors. Thank you very much again for your time. It was a pleasure to speak to you today.